What's going on everybody? This is Alex, a doctoral candidate at NUS Business School in Singapore, and I welcome you to another episode of the Foresight Chats. In each episode of this series, I have a conversation with a leading figure in the field of futures and foresight, to whom I try to ask crucial, difficult, sometimes ignored, sometimes even not so politically correct questions about the field and about the futures in general encouraging critical discussions that perhaps have not been heard of. The guest I'm talking to today is someone who has built a truly outstanding career not only in the practice of foresight and scenario planning in organizations, but also as a well-known scholar in this field. Today, I have the privilege to talk to Paul Schumacher. Paul Shoemaker is an expert, an entrepreneur, and an educator in the fields of strategy, innovation, and decision-making. He was the founder, CEO, and chairman of Decision Strategies International, which specialized in scenario planning and strategy. He recently founded Q2 Tech, which develops digital tools, trainings, and consulting based on his decades of business experiences with hundreds of organizations around the world. He has also helped Royal Dutch Shell to further develop its scenario planning methodology. On the top of that, Paul has also been very active in academia. He has taught thousands of students on these subjects at the University of Chicago. He served for a decade as the research director of the Mac Center for Technological Innovation at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. And he has written 12 books and well over 100 articles in academic and applied journals. In my conversation with Paul, we first talk about one of the most all-encompassing themes of his scholarship and practice, organizational vigilance. We also talk about the difference between organizational vigilance and foresight. Paul explains why many organizations are not vigilant, why business schools are not teaching vigilance and, in fact, foresight and gives some great pieces of advice to business school's researchers on how to conduct research on these themes. Then we close the conversation by talking about Paul's journey at Shell, where he first familiarized himself with scenario planning, about how to understand and excel at scenarios, and about Paul's current research projects. This conversation is so important to me because Paul, like me, has been a strong proponent of teaching and researching foresight in business schools. Certainly, there are very good reasons to teach foresight in any school, including public policy schools, environmental sustainability schools, and many others. But my personal opinion on this is that if I had to choose where to place a foresight department in a university, I would possibly choose a business school. And that is because teaching and researching foresight in business schools would increase the awareness of for-profit organizations about foresight. And no matter whether we like it or not, a large majority of our social environment is constituted by such workplaces. Paying attention to foresight in common workplaces would increase the demand for foresight professionals. This would in turn incentivize more intellectuals to teach and research how to conduct foresight at best. This would further advance the quality and effectiveness of foresight practices and processes, making it clearer and clearer that companies cannot do without it. Eventually, when the awareness of and demand of foresight skills is high in the social environment at large, any institutions, communities, and governments, even those not for profit, would be able to benefit from this, to absorb foresight skills, and to incorporate them in their operations, in a manner that wouldn't be possible if we had originally advocated for the inclusion of foresight in more marginal schools in universities rather than in business schools. So although my conversation with Paul was not concerned about this, it sort of was based on such a common viewpoint and built further from that. But other than being important, my conversation with Paul was also very enjoyable. In fact, Paul is one of the very few people who would share very insightful conceptual points about foresight, while also mentioning tons of examples taken from his decades-long experience in helping major organizations undertaking foresight and improving their strategies. 
So this conversation appeals to both academics as well as consultants and practitioners who want to keep abreast of what is the cutting edge of foresight practice. So I hope you will enjoy the conversation. Paul, I'm so grateful that you are on the show. I can tell you what a pleasure it is to finally talk to you. Thank you, Alex. Yes, we we know each other uh, from our writings, <laughs> but not from <laughs> conversation yet. <laughs> That's usually the case in academia. Actually, Indeed. when I was uh, learning how to teach scenario planning, one of my mentors uh, always said, if you want to learn more, go and read Paul Shoemaker's articles. So that's what I did. And my intellectual journey in Forested and Scenario literally went along me reading your articles. So that's why I'm so honored to finally talk to you. Now, you have covered a lot of ground in your writings from scenarios to weak signals, from vigilant organizations to foresight. So there is a lot of stuff I would love to talk about with you. But I was thinking that we could start from the most uh, all-encompassing theme, the most foundational part of it, at least to my understanding, which is organizational vigilance. And um, I was just reading uh, one of your articles published on MIT's Loan Management Review in preparation for this, and I found the definition that you gave of vigilance, which is a heightened state of awareness characterized by curiosity, alertness, and willingness to act on incomplete information. So my first question for you would be, do you still stand for this definition? And if yes, why is vigilance so important for an organization? Well, many organizations, as you know, get blindsided. And the question is, well, you cannot see everything coming because you would have to invest enormously in doing research and foresight. So a certain amount of error and not knowing the future is un unavoidable. But if you ask many boards or C-suites, um, let's look at your past. What have you missed? These could be threats. They could be opportunities. Um, they could be internal to the organization, like Volkswagen not realizing or maybe realizing but ignoring you know, the manipulations of their software for testing uh, exhaust uh, 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 pipes, et cetera. Um, or Wells Fargo ignoring maybe, or not seeing soon enough the leaders that is uh, opening up accounts for customers without their permission or selling insurance to them without them knowing it would not uh, work well. And then there's the external side. So most companies, if they, we, we ask them to complete a matrix, how much have you missed either internally or externally? And uh, it wasn't more like a threat or more like an opportunity. And most people fill in multiple items for each cell of the matrix. And then I ask a very simple question. Is this acceptable to you? Is this is a good trade-off between um, doing a lot of studies about what's going on uh, and not missing much versus not wasting all your time pursuing every you know, weak signal because of so many weak signals and being... Uh... And most would say, no, we have to become more vigilant. Many of these things, and somebody knew about it in the organization, but they didn't know that other people needed to know or the leaders didn't know where that knowledge resided. It's really a problem oftentimes of distributed intelligence, right? It's rare to think, I would challenge you, think of one thing that happened to an organization that did not foreshadow itself in some way. In hindsight, we can always see early signals. The problem is they don't all get presented on a gold platter in combination. They arrive uh, in different forms, in different parts of the enterprise uh, or the extended network of the enterprise. So if you think of an organization as having needing to have also a strategic radar, think of all the suppliers on the upstream side, all the you know, uh, distributors and partners and customers on the downstream side. There is an enormous amount of information and vigilance is really about making sense of that and acting on that in real time rather than, you know, waiting five months before something gets analyzed. Euro Disney is a great example. When Disney opened up its, uh, in Europe, its theme park, they were studying where to do it in Barcelona and they picked Paris. And they based it, of course, understandably on the US model, which was California and Florida and Japan. They were also developing it there. And they, they made a lot of uh, wrong assumptions, which you can blame them for. They didn't know the French culture as fully as uh, they could have, maybe should have. So they wouldn't serve wine, or they assumed that people would stand in line much longer than the, than the Europeans actually wanted to do. 
uh, the Europeans didn't consume as much of, of the concessions during lunch. They would bring their own sandwich and ask for water. I mean, I'm Dutch, so I can make a joke about, uh, about those things. Uh, and you, that is understandable. But then they didn't realize uh, that their assumptions were wrong till two years after they opened. Uh, whereas this information had been coming in all along, but it was piecemeal and it was distributed throughout the enterprise. And of course, Disney almost went bankrupt. There was a real financing issue and we refinanced. So it's this phenomenon, I think, that's why vigilance is important. And the definition you sort of mentioned about being mindful, this concept of mindfulness, Anna Langer has been studying this, is a, is a very uh, au courant notion. People find this an intriguing concept that we are not sufficient in the moment sometimes to really see what's happening left and right. And at the same time, have an eye on the future. And that's what makes all this so difficult. Well, it seems that it is a, a kind of mindfulness that is distributed in an organization. Can we say that? Yes. Uh, when you talk about vigilance, the first thing that comes to my mind is preparedness as well, right? Because it's very related to finding weak signals and emerging issues of change and possibly also discontinuities in order to be prepared. So the preparedness aspect is uh, what to me is very salient. Uh, but then I'm thinking, what is the difference between this vigilance and what we say is more about looking at the futures in the larger perspective of foresight, right? So what is the difference? What would be the difference then between vigilance and foresight? Is one conducive to the other, which I, I guess that's where you're trying to go? Yes, they linked, but they're not the same. Well, foresight, by definition, has a future orientation, right? I mean, we're talking about forecasting and casting forward the momentum of the present, which really is fueled by the past. Uh, vigilance need not have that notion. You could be vigilant mm. about right now, as I look around me here, uh, am I vigilant? Am I aware of what's happening right now, time, you know, T0? Now, vigilance also means uh, being aware of what's coming around the corner, so it has both of those connotations. Um, to do foresight well, you need to have some sense of, of, you have to be good at vigilance. But the term, if you go to the Latin root, and you're Italian, you probably know this better than I do, but it is about vigil, holding a vigil, or a, vigils were really the centurions, the people who protected the castle. So they were, uh, think of China and the Chinese wall, and one wall at the side of the wall is lower than the other side because they had in mind where the enemy was coming from. That side is larger, right, taller. And they were on the lookout. They know what they were looking for oftentimes. Uh, they're looking for known enemies, uh, sort of symmetric warfare. Now, this is a problem that the intelligence community has in now, of course, fighting mm -hmm. terrorism and cybersecurity issues, et cetera, that they don't know where the enemy comes from. So vigilance is a heightened state of awareness about things that may be relevant, but you don't know what to look for necessarily. To me, in foresight, uh, there's often more definition about what we are trying to uh, anticipate. Uh, are we looking about the oil price? Are we talking about an election? Are we talking about a new technology? But these are semantic distinctions, so I think not everybody may uh, accept that. So I think they're highly correlated. What is interesting is they don't have the important element that you talked about, of action or preparedness. Um, you could be highly vigilant and see a lot of things and don't do anything about it. And then it goes to not. And you could also have a lot of foresight, but if you don't have a capacity to act on that, then why do this? So with uh, George Day, a, a good friend and colleague at the Wharton School, we just published a book in, with MIT Press um, titled See Sooner and Act Faster. And it, it tries to address these, the coupling of these two. And in a highly volatile world, you cannot do it as sequentially as maybe decision analysis or theory would like. First, we define the problem, and then we frame it, and then we get the intelligence, and then we think about what's important to us, criteria for choice, and then we make a choice. I think the, the, it, the iterative feedback loops in, in a turbulent environment are much tighter, much smaller. So it is much more a, on all the time a learning process where signals come in, you need to um, connect dots, you need to reframe your thinking about it, then you need to probe and take some action to better understand it. Sometimes you have to make preemptive moves to get a competitive advantage, so it's more than a learning action, it is a positional action. And uh, 
and then the work by David Tees, of course, on developing, uh, you know, dynamic capabilities, but they are about sensing and then they're about interpreting, but they're also about seizing uh, the opportunities. Right. And so that, that part is not always as well integrated, I feel. Good that you mentioned the work you've done with George Day, and also good that you mentioned that they're always or often uh, not integrated. Because uh, when you when you were mentioning about this idea of being alert to environmental changes, it it comes to my mind the fact that vigilance is always or often compared to the state of being vulnerable, which is also something you talk about, right? So our organization is vulnerable when it is not vigilant and or when it's poorly vigilant so then it it begs the question how can we teach organizations to be more vigilant and especially more to interest uh, of interest to us in a business schools why are business schools not teaching it so much because if many organizations are in need of learning to be vigilant well this seems to be there seems to be a latent need for teaching this capability Yes, very much so. And uh, and we have a survey in this book that I mentioned, and we did some research. It was actually published in Futures and Foresight Science last year. You, 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 kind of, you know the paper, but it's maybe worth mentioning. We looked at three different groups, international companies. We looked at credit unions, which are nonprofits in, in U.S. credit unions, uh, member-owned cooperatives. Think of them as financial cooperatives. And then we also looked at foundations, uh, foundations, U.S. foundations with the Council on Foundations. And we adapted the survey to use the terminology, you know, that's appropriate for them. So don't talk about customers or clients, maybe in some settings, but members. But other than that, it was the same survey. And we asked a lot of questions about whether they have good networks, whether they uh, have invested in foresight methodologies, whether they have been surprised very often by the past, etc. Plus, lots of you know demographics about who they are, what where they where they based, uh, etc. How much is international versus domestic revenues, and we then submitted it to a sort of a multivariate analysis, and and basically drew the conclusion that four factors matter a great deal, and the most important was really leaders, the leadership of an enterprise having signaling commitment to the importance of vigilance, meaning they welcome signals even if they're not part of the agenda for that meeting or if they are outside of the lane where this person is supposed to work. And I'm going to give a talk tomorrow to a large insurance company where they say, if, if people in that organization, which is a very strong uh, operational, you know, performance-oriented culture, but not a learning culture, if people start to say too much about, you know, another department or another function uh, across the organizational boundaries internally, you know, in other another uh, stovepipes, uh, then um, that, they get criticized for that. Stay in your lane, right? And so it, leaders have to say, listen, all of you are the eyes and the ears of the organization, and not only you internally, all of you have contacts. You have children, you have families, you have business partners, you read the paper just, or you listen to uh, television programs or pods, or whatever, and um, you all have to share things that you think may be relevant, even if you cannot prove it. And that's the problem. Most people in large, I worked at Royal Dutch Shell, you don't go into those senior meetings unprepared. And if you want to raise an issue where you say, oh, this could be important to us, but you haven't done your homework and you don't have an answer to the question, so why is this important to us? That's not going to fly. And so I did an, a short article on the importance of doubt and leaders creating the space to have constructive doubts where people can uh, uh, verbalize uh, concerns they have about either an action that is being taken without being able to exactly say what concerns them. You're really tapping into uh, feelings and an unconsciousness almost that things don't seem right. This is curious. This is anomalous. And the best example is, of course, the CEO of DuPont, who just before the financial crisis uh, he went to Japan to talk to an important customer, and the customer asked for a postponement of payments because they had cash flow issues. And that happened, so he, he made a note, but then he went back to Wilmington. Uh, DuPont is in Wilmington, Delaware. And then he attended a meeting for a retiring employee, and, and somebody mentioned to him, again, sort of accidentally, that the Hotel DuPont, where most of their uh, customer suppliers, partners stay, 
was way below normal occupancy. It had 30% occupancy, it should have 80%. And that was not a little weak signal. And then uh, two weeks or four weeks thereafter, he had his regular production meeting with his senior team and they talked about uh, Detroit, the car makers, they sell a lot of uh, polymers and that kind of stuff to Detroit. And they, the, the team said, listen, we haven't gotten their numbers yet. Uh, normally it is just in time supply. But GM was not able to tell them what the quantities were or that they were going to sell and what, how much inventory they needed, etc. So this uh, Chuck Holliday is his name, the CEO, and this is the example of leadership, re realized there were three disconnected pieces that may have a common, a common root. Right. So, and he was, he was feeling, but it was a feeling that we were going to hit a wall financially. This was in you know, 2008, early 2008. So then he asked his own CFO, how's our own cash flow doing? And we got information. And he came back and said, yeah, we, we, we're picking up ripples. You know, companies are uh, mm. scared. And then, and this is the courage of leadership, then without having complete information, without being able to prove the case to you, if you were his doctoral, if you were doing a dissertation, you wouldn't accept this case. It doesn't, it's not beyond reasonable doubt. It's not even that the preponderance of evidence to use legal terms uh, are overwhelming. So what he did is he said, listen, I think we will hit a wall. And he said that memo, he said, all of you need to uh, reserve cash. Uh, downscale your investments, but, and this is good, he said, we probably will hit a really bad uh, recession, but he said, I also want to plan for how to rebound. And because this won't last, it may be one year, two years, I, I don't know, he said, it lasted, of course, by two or three years, and a long tail, actually, this recession. Um, and that, that is unusual. If you look at the COVID crisis, for example, where a lot of weak signals came and we were generally late in picking, detecting what really was going on, but very few uh, companies uh, had good, uh, you know, rebounding plans. Some do, and George and I wrote a few articles about the role of boards and C-suites in um, sort of what uh, Nietzsche said, what, what, what does it kill you should make you stronger, or, or what Taleb talks about in anti-fragility. Do you have an organization that if it gets hit and it gets surprised, that it actually gets stronger after that, just like the human body, if it survives, you know, infection, it will be stronger. Most organizations don't have that, those capabilities. And that's part of vigilance as well. It's not just the anticipation, it's also how you process it and how you bounce back and learn from each challenge. Well, the key is finding the state of vigilance or non-vigilance when it's early enough, right? So I think your uh, surveys in this regard are good diagnostics, uh, especially before such things happen. Yeah. Well, and let me just, if I may, just finish the story because of four factors. So I mentioned yes. leadership commitment. That was the number one variable that got the most, explained most of the variance. The second one was investments in foresight. So we asked companies, do you do scenario planning? Do you do real options analysis? Do you have strategic radars? How well do you integrate this? And that was weak. Many companies don't do much and don't use artificial intelligence. You, you can be quite sophisticated there. And then the, there were two other variables that were important, but they were in the sense that you, these are necessary conditions, but not really sufficient conditions. And one had to do with the strategic planning process. Do you have a strategic planning process that respects and surfaces uncertainty, that can handle uncertainty? Or do you put it under the rug and ask people to make point estimates of sales when it's very uncertain, so they at a minimum should be given ranges, not point estimates, or they should be given scenarios about the future, but many don't do that. And then the last one is also important is coordination and uh, accountability, because in many companies you may have the leader saying, listen, be our eyes and ears, but we worked with one, I can't mention the name of the company, but a leading company in sort of a the healthcare technology space. And the people said, yeah, we pick up a lot of signals and we give it then to our senior leaders and we never hear anything back. So they don't feel that, that it registers. Now the leaders say, yeah, we act on that, but they don't know about, there's no reward for this in any way. Uh, and so they don't close the loop on these things efficiently. So accountability and, um, and coordination in the organization gets to be important. So you're fighting all the all these organizational bound the turf issues. I think are active in a distributed uh, intelligence environment. Uh, the turf issues become a real problem. That it doesn't go. It doesn't flow quickly enough to where it needs to go. The information. 
Well, it's fascinating because everything you said is in theory very teachable, right? Once you find that an organization is not vigilant, uh, you can implement some procedures. And at the end of the day, vigilance is the state of vigilance is just about looking for the signal. So there are uh, weak signals searching methods that you can teach. And if we talk about foresight, which is the next step, there is a bunch of methods there as well. And the, the last stage, possibly the reconfiguring, so to speak, also is about, as you say, coordination and distributed knowledge. So everything is teachable, right? But then uh, to me is super intriguing the fact that business schools are not promoting this uh, kind of uh, pedagogy, right? And you have been a strong advocate of changing this. So why do you think why do you think that is the case? Why do you think business schools are not so keen in teaching uh, vigilance and foresight and all that is related to that? Yeah, that's a great question. So as you know, I did an article in 2008 in the California Management Review about uh, the paradigm of business education and research perhaps needing to change. And it was based, by the way, on work I did at Wharton. I was then the research director of an institute called the Mac Institute for Emerging Technologies and Innovation. And we deliberately studied cases where there is a great deal of ambiguity, emerging technologies. And, and we looked at established companies mostly, how well do they integrate? And most of these companies say, we don't know what to do with emerging technologies. It could be blockchain or it could, you know, whatever it happens to be, Bitcoin. I mean, take some of these things that are out there and who knows whether they should they do anything with that. Um, and in that article, I sort of looked at, and there's many other people who've talked about this issue that if you you have to sort of look at the history of how business schools arose, right? They were really vocational training schools in the 1950s and 60s. And then there were scathing critiques by several foundations uh, that uh, this was not really uh, deserving of being taught in a university. It was not science-based. It was not discipline-based. And so four schools got a lot of funding to make it more rigorous. And then it became a very disciplined-based field. So in business schools, you have to pick your concentration, your majors, you're in a department. And I've been in multiple business schools as a faculty member, and you don't really deal much with the other departments. Now, I was at the University of Chicago, which is small, and cleverly, the dean's office put all the mailboxes in the same room. At Wharton, you couldn't do that because it's a huge institution. So I would run into, so I was in the field of uh, decision sciences at the time or the Center for Decision Research. But as I picked up my mail, I would run into people from finance or marketing and got to know these people and then just played tennis with them and then started to talk to them. So they created actually an environment where these cross-boundary uh, dialogues were more easy. But if you really look at the challenges, and I, I just read a few here very quickly because uh, I, I wrote yeah. them down. I started the article by saying, what are the paradoxes now of, for a CEO or for a leader to deal with the issues? And you have these conflicting things you need to balance. You have to have a strong commitment you know, to, to a plan is necessary, but you also need to keep your options open. So how do you do these both at the same time? You may have to be a pioneer if you really want to win big, although there's a whole literature on fast followers, but most pioneers fail. So you, so a list I ticked off, I won't do them all, but you know, you talked about core competencies. You need to leverage core competencies or capabilities, yet organizational separation is often important for the new co versus the old co, right? If you have and new ventures, they often get killed, the antibodies of the old system, you know, kill the, the innovation. Competition is usually intense, so you have to be very competitive, but you also need to collaborate. This co-opetition try to capture that notion. And of course, focus. We, we talk about focus, focus, focus. Many people overly focused, and George Day and I did some mm -hmm. book on peripheral vision, and we said the price of focus is that you lose sight of the periphery. You can, the eyes cannot do both. That famous video about, you know, count how often the basketball is played, yeah. just counting interferes with seeing the gorilla walk through the scene. So if you look at these paradoxes, and there's more, they are not addressed or addressable within one discipline. They are mm -hmm. cross-disciplinary notions. So if you already set up by finance, marketing, operations, research, and what have oh, you, yeah. and stra strategy is the only discipline that tries to be integrative in business schools. And it's usually taught in the second year of policy course. You've taught them as well, I'm sure, et cetera. And unlike 
uh, and unlike medical schools now, medical schools are reorganizing not around functions, medical functions, anatomy and what have you, but around problems. So they do elder care, women's care, mm -hmm. infants, and that forces you to get across these disciplines. So that's what is needed. We need to really, if, if we had in business school a department called innovation, and we had a course called innovation, then that would have to be staffed by definition by people with economic backgrounds, with behavioral backgrounds, with operations research backgrounds, et cetera. But that's not happening. So we get a reinforcement of a myopic perspective that is highly discipline based. And if you just look at the reward system, the highest paid faculty in America, I don't know if it's in Singapore, highest paid faculty and finance faculty, followed by accounting faculty. And you wonder why. And the reason is it's physics envy. I was trained, in, I started in physics and then I, when I did my bachelor's, moved into finance actually at Wharton and then operations research. So I came out of a quantitative you know, tradition, but there is definite physics envy. If you don't make these papers, and I did a lot of them myself, yeah. quantitative and rigorous and grounded in one discipline, then you're not playing the game that gets you promoted. Yeah, it is a, a, a issue of incentive for sure. Uh, it is also an issue of siloed disciplines. Uh, and that makes it very clear that from an administrative perspective, it would be good to create departments from scratch that are more multidisciplinary, if not transdisciplinary in nature, in order to tackle these issues in modern organizations. But then that is for policy administrators, right? school administrators. So how about for regular research? No, 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 uh, allow me, uh, Alessandro, just to make a point there. You, we are not going to put get the borders down of departments, right? The, the tenured faculty control basically these departments. You can create centers and institutes that are matrix organizations that cut across. And so, what we did at Wharton, we created thanks to uh, a benefactor, um, Bill Mack, uh, who gave us forty million and then another forty million. So we could create a center where we fund research and 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 and. Uh, and not only that, had multidisciplinary faculty leaders on the board of the center, and um, also get students in the MBA program involved with the members, uh, the companies that are members of that center or that institute <clears throat> in order to tackle their issues. This was totally a very interdisciplinary exercise. So, the, 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 and there's at Wharton, take that example, there was about 20 centers, research centers. And some, half of them are within a particular discipline. There may be a real estate center and they focus on real estate. But several straddle, if you will, multiple disciplines. Understood. So without possibly dismantling other uh, departments, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, really a matrix. It's, it's really a matrix structure, if you think about it. But the centers cannot necessarily promote faculty. So they cannot sometimes right. have postdocs. So they don't, they're not equal to, the, to a department in terms of power and strength. I understand. Um, and what, what about normal researchers, regular human beings, right? If you're somebody who's listening to this conversation and is intrigued in possibly doing research about these issues and also teaching about these issues, right? Which are oftentimes not regarded as the standard establish a classic curriculum, so to speak. So what kind of advice would you give to that kind of, of folks? Yeah, so it depends a little bit where you are. If you're a junior faculty member who still needs to get tenure, then you have to kind of publish in the accepted journals that uh, the committee reviewing you will look at. So you're a little bit in a bind. It depends how se self-confident you are. If you're a really excellent researcher and you're going to make it somewhere and you're not overly tied to a particular institution and you don't have overly to play the politics you just pursue what you think is the right thing and you may be one of the future stars but that's not just like in business and many ceos who really are become stars have often been fired and often and, and switched to other companies much more often their loyalty in other words is not to their institution the loyalty is to their uh, their paradigm or their vision about how it should be. So in the article, I just mentioned a few things. I listed for teaching recommend, if you want to be more this all round person, and people in strategy should particularly do that. I think you need to blend clinical research and sort of um, more scholarly based. It, it cannot be, you know, shooting from the hip. It has to be grounded to have legitimacy. I think you need to develop a more problem centered approach, which is what the case method does, you know, as Harvard does it. 
Uh, and you need to bring in then speakers from industry and government, if you like, to enrich the contents. Because if you have, and the cases shouldn't be historical cases so much. That's the problem with the case method. When I did my MBA, we did a lot of cases, but the world was more stable. But now, if you take a case that is 10 years old, it doesn't have the most recent, it doesn't have social media in it sufficiently. It hasn't, so it looks, it depends on the case, but it often looks to be uh, out of touch with current reality. The, the fun part of looking at problems right now, real problems, if you're in organization theory, you say, okay, what should leaders who are, let's say, Caucasian say about the Black Lives Matter movement? Uh, because I, that's, that's an issue they struggle with. I got several calls from people saying our leaders want to support this. They want equal rights and, you know, and civil rights, but they don't know how to address this subject. They feel it's a mind, minefield. If they say one word wrong or one thing wrong, they are hurt. So how do people who, who do ethics, who do um, organization theory, who do strategy, who do um, human resources, how do you tackle that problem? You can be silent. Silence is consent for the past. Yeah. And, and that's not right. Uh, you don't have to be Martin Luther King and, and be a, you know, a revolutionary who changes the world. But you have to acknowledge the legitimacy of the issues and address how this organization is supportive of it. Now, that's not a simple problem because it involves lots of different things. It, it cuts across disciplines. So tackling uh, real world issues, I think is important. Make students co-creators of the educational process. Mm -hmm. So don't lecture, don't speak so much just from the top down. Assume that bottom up, and I've learned that the hard way, I've taught a lot of cases. I was amazed having taught a case maybe 50 times that still there are new perspectives, the, the 51st wow. time that come out. Now, you would think by then, and, and of course the Harvard faculty is very good at this, they will study all these cases and look at all the angles, almost have a decision tree, what could happen, and they make sure that the discussion goes to the point that they want to make. But is that really co-creation, or is that being a conductor of an orchestra, and now and then you give the trumpets, you know, opportunity, an improvisational orchestra, I should say, and that's how they, in a sense, control the, the, the direction. Anyway. So that's on the teaching side. On research, it's more complicated because mm. we are not set up, unless you can get your own funding and get field research and you have a five-year time frame, you cannot tackle the bigger issues. You will end up carving out small things that tend to be incremental, uh, maybe, uh, et cetera. And it's just, that's the safe route. But ideally, you, you ally yourself with people who do have some funding, senior faculty, that is, by its nature, interdisciplinary. So again, in the Wharton case, the Mac Institute would fund junior faculty members who come out of accounting, or as I said, some of the other disciplines, but to look over, their, over the uh, boundaries of their field. And I think you can also make a name, but that's dangerous as a junior academic, to challenge what gurus are writing in popular books about business and either validate or challenge it, but take a position on it. I don't think we should yield the practice of business to the consulting firms and the popular writers who may or may not come out of academia. And academia should be more than just a validator after the fact, looking backwards. It should be more involved in, in real time, addressing and pressing issues so that there is more voice given to, to academics. Because I do believe science ultimately is the only <laughs> good path to the truth. It's, uh, you've written a lot about epistemology and things like that. And it's not the only path. It has many errors. But I say to people, given our anti-science climate in the United States, I said, who would you trust more than scientists? Yes, it isn't perfect. And there has been manipulation of environmental studies and, you know, sexing up the data, to etc. They're not, they're not imperfect, imperfect. But I don't know anything better. And look at the results we got, whether it's the vaccines or just progress since the Middle Ages to what we now do. Uh, mostly that was done through the scientific process. Well, yeah, you're touching a point that you know I'm very interested in as we just published with Thomas Charmack a paper on this. So I'm very into this. And uh, if I may add to your point, at the end of the day, yes, science is not to be thrown away together with the bathwater, right? Even if it has a lot of issues. Um, and at the end of the day, we can we can fix those issues. But so uh, to me, and that's a great also, paper, but I, let me say that's a great paper you wrote and I have a commentary on it. I've seen it yet. But anyway, yes, and thank paper. you for the commentary. Actually, the commentary also uh, was pointing to what I was what I was trying to say, which is to me, it is also about trying to use the scientific method 
to prove the validity of the uh, vigilant, uh, cap our vigilance, vigilant capabilities and foresight capabilities in an organization. And this is something you have done quite well, actually, as you have demonstrated in your commentary, because I, I remember that you mentioned some of your work in, in this space. Uh, and just to mention one, I remember you did a study for SMJ, published on SMJ, where you uh, proved that scenario planning can widen the confidence of um, individuals who are exposed to it, right? So those yeah. those things are actually, uh, I believe, a good way to somehow uh, embed the research on vigilance and foresight, which are very complex issues, into a business school paradigm using the scientific method to simply prove their outcomes. So you have been um, definitely an example on that. And since we're talking about scenarios uh, and uh, research on scenarios, uh, I, I would like to move on to that theme as well, because to me, you are one of the major um, proponents of a, a rigorous and uh, very well conceptual, conceptualized scenario planning approach. So I, I just want to ask you, I'm going to assume that the audience has a familiarity with scenario planning. How can we master scenarios? I'm going to just go that step further and ask you a more complex question. How can we be good at scenarios? What are the key issues that you have learned over the years to yeah. be a That's scenario That's a great master? question. Yeah. Uh, just briefly, I learned about scenario planning from Royal Dutch Shell. I have to give credit. I was doing research on behavioral, sort of Kahneman and Tversky kind of research, biases, heuristics, and that kind of stuff at, at the University of Chicago. And I took a sabbatical just after being promoted to a social professor. I figured I should take a little bit of risk here. And, and I got an invitation from Shell to visit on my next visit. I read one of my books about uh, managing risk. And uh, I met Pierre Bach, who was uh, about to retire three years later. And he was the uh, champion, really, with Ted Nuland of scenario planning at Shell. He's a French economist who was really operating in different spheres. He was in touch with, you know, uh, he would take his vacations uh, with more primitive tribes in Indonesia to get out of the bubble of Shell and the oil industry. So he was a very fascinating person. And what he was good at, he said, we have to tell different stories and we have to challenge people's mental models. So at Shell, scenario plan, that's where I learned it. And then I moved somewhat further in a different direction after I Left. I was there for two years. So, because I asked, I asked your question to Pierre Bach. I said, Pierre, uh, could you tell me in, in, in brief what is scenario planning? And he said, Paul, I can give you the elevator speech, right? But if you really want to know, you have to join us for two years. Wow. So, and that's it. And I said, and I would love for you to join because you have studied biases. He says, what we have, we know how to tell interesting stories about the future, and that seems to work in our very complex culture. But we don't know what to do with the stories. Uh, we have uh, people only have one budgeting process. They cannot do five budgets uh, for different scenarios. So he was thinking about what kind of goes after you. So we have to dis distinguish scenario planning is two phases. One is developing views about the future that really deal with the things you don't control, the exogenous part of the world. And then you move to the part that you do control, the endogenous part, namely your strategy. And you have to make sure that you have strategies that you can win in some sense, no matter what happens, and that's maybe too strong because you may end up with very risk-averse strategies where you don't stick out your neck. So there is a trade-off between risk and return as you try to think about that. But Shell was, in the beginning, it was an art. There were a few people who were very good looking at the future of the oil industry, looking out 5 to 10, 20 years. It depends on the sector. Shell was a three-dimensional matrix, so it had you know, business sectors, oil and gas, upstream and downstream, and petrochemicals and metals and even biomass in Brazil, et cetera, that they were working on. And then they have the regions of the world and each country is its own operating company. So that's, they make all the decisions uh, tactically, but strategically they wanted an overlay that comes from the board of directors, what they call the committee of managing directors and the board talking about, you know, will there be a global recession? What's going to happen to decarbonization? What's how is regulation changing uh, currency levels, uh, GNP growth, all these factors. And they were very good at telling stories that challenged people's mental models. So the, 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 we always said scenario planning at Shell is not about planning. It's about challenging people's mental models. That was the premise. 
These scenarios that were issued after lots of internal debate were literally 50 page longer, 100 page documents that uh, wow. explained the history of, let's say, the, uh, the refinery industry and in, let's say it, and it was global. And then later, these global scenarios would be translated into regional scenarios by the regional organizations, because Shell is a huge company, right? So it, these regional organizations or these sectors are 1,500 companies in their own right, like Deutsche Shell and Shell Francaise, even the countries would be in Shell UK, are huge or enterprises with their own planners. So they would translate these global scenarios into elaborate and translate them. And sometimes there were problems. I remember you in Asia, we had a scenario that, uh, that there would be a global recession. And the people in Malaysia and Asia, where in Malaysia, as you know, uh, Shell is a huge gas field, they simply could not see any clouds on the horizon. They could not imagine that the high growth that was happening in the 1980s uh, and, and, and 90s, that that would not continue. And they were correct. It wasn't a totally synchronized economy. But later, the recession did happen. So then the question is, should Asia be allowed to have its own scenarios? And Shell was very clever. They would say, listen, we sit in London. <clears throat> we're the bankers. We just want to tell you how we see the world. Just keep in mind, we ultimately have to approve your budgets. So if you don't speak to the issues we raise, your chance of getting funding is a little less. But you don't have to. It was not you know, top down. If you want to make your case in a different way, be our guest. So that's how they did it. So scenario planning to me is um, a very broad approach that says we want to be explicit about things we don't know. We don't want to push it under the rug. And it is especially appropriate in cases where the uncertainty is of a kind that doesn't fit a more probabilistic decision analytic framework. And it is about helping test strategies. So the purpose is either to stress test your current strategy, how would this hold up under this future narrative. And Case van der Heiden, who I worked a lot with at Shell, mostly with him actually, and we wrote some articles about the Shell approach. Uh, he wrote a very interesting book uh, and, some, and one other book as well about that the purpose is really to enhance the caliber of the strategic conversations. That's scenario planning is ultimately about the quality of the ensuing conversations. And as you know, to have deep dialogue, <coughs> excuse me, in an, in an organization, that is not easy to orchestrate. You need uh, mutual trust and, and you need mutual respect. So people who don't respect each other <coughs> are not going to have deep dialogue. I mean, so if, if, if the upstream sector looks down on the marketing function of, let's say, and, and there was a little bit the case that upstream in oil companies in general, they are the kings, right? The people who find the oil and uh, bring it to the surface. The rest is all kind of playing in a good hands later, you know, playing it out. So, and the upstream at Shell did not embrace scenario planning. These, you have to realize these are all engineers and people with physics mm -hmm. and chemistry backgrounds. They considered a lot of this bullshit, you know, they didn't think that this was, this was wow. touchy feely stuff. Right. Luckily, the board of directors endorsed it. And, uh, and Ari de Geus, who was the head of strategic planning when I was there, who wrote a very interesting book himself about the living corporation and the need to create learning cultures, he's, he recognized that scenarios, qualitative narratives are not enough. You need to quantify what the consequences of that scenario are for things that go into the decisions these people have to make. So at the end of these typical shell reports in the past, when I was there and later as well, there was appendices that said, if Scenario A. So they would basically say the oil prices would could be in this band, or currency rates could be in this band, or GDP. And there were literally managers who were not intellectually curious about the future for in a deeper level. They would simply skip the scenarios, go to the appendices, mm -hmm. look at the ranges on oil prices, put that into their NPV analyses, right? And that's how they used it. But that was an impoverished use of scenarios. Yeah, it's very interesting that you mentioned that uh, they just use the range of values produced by the scenarios because to me that is an, an indication of the oftentimes uh, misunderstood nature of the use of scenarios. And I, I'm glad you mentioned that they are for they they are meant to create a dialogue in an organization and to enhance the mental models because oftentimes, uh, unfortunately, I believe that scenarios are just seen as an extended prediction, right? And the fact that you just mentioned that they were used as, um, the, the, the output of them were just used to, to be prepared for the future and that's it, rather than 
uh, stimulating the dialogue. It to me is another signal of of this issue. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. Now, Paul, I I noticed that our time together is. Uh, approaching the end so i'm i want to be conscious of your time I, let me ask you just uh, one more question what are you up to at the moment uh, what what is uh keeping you awake at night in the space of of your research and, and teaching and consulting what is exciting you uh, and uh what are you working on well thanks for asking <clears throat> so the topic of uncertainty and complexity is very uh, still uh, on my mind and uh, I tend to work with other people, not in my discipline. So I try to practice what we just talked about. For example, with Phil Tetlock, who is a uh, social psychologist oh, yeah. and a political scientist. He's really well known. He did a great article just now about how the intelligence community in the United States, and he's worked a lot with them, with uh, IARPA, uh, how they need to change their approach to understanding what North Korea is maybe doing with the, with the nuclear threat, etc. And I we, we both feel that the integration between qualitative and quantitative analyses is not strong at the moment. And you can see, so, and he's studying more how good are the predictions that people make. So he will test whether your predictions a year out about whether Assad will still be in power in Syria. He has these super forecasters. He does a great book right, on that topic right, and a whole right. research stream. And he realizes that when the scenarios are out 10 years, 15, 20 years, how do you couple that and can you even put probabilities? Those, of course, very epistemological questions. Is it meaningful to put a probability mm. on a scenario when Highly the scenario discussed. is not really yeah. well-defined? It's not, you know, you, you need a really clear outcome space if you think of rolling the die or cards. You need to know what are the possible outcomes and they are underspecified, so you have an underspecified model. So how do you, how do, you do that? And I think the issue is one, Time frames differ, short-term forecasting more and long-term. There are, of course, long-term forecasts as well, but not that many that are in econometrics, let's say. They don't go out 20, 30, 50 years. There are people who do complex cycles that may be 50-year cycles, but that, that's not really, by econometric standards, it doesn't cut, you know, cut what, what they would expect. Scenarios that can be very long-term. The longest I've done 40-year scenarios on, you know, forestry, where it takes a forest 40 years to recycle, especially where you are in Malaysia. They go much faster than they do in Finland. Mm. <laughs> These forests, twice as fast. So um, I think the integration of those two. So quant qual, we call it. And I did a book, just in closing, I did a book on profiting from uncertainty where I put a right. spectrum of knowledge out. And I say we, we can study cases of certainty, like linear programming problems or inventory problems, cases of risk, sort of the whole multi-attribute utility space and, you know, what, what is, what's known as managerial economics at Harvard, where Howard Rafa and other people did a lot of good work. Then you're getting the case of um, uncertainty where you don't really know the probability. So in the earlier cases, you have to know what the problem are problem is you have to know the solution possibilities and you have sufficient estimates quantitatively of probabilities and outcomes and these are crisp in uncertainty you don't have that the probabilities are not crisp so flipping a coin that is not fair that has been weighted and you know with a tape on it or something and that becomes difficult to put probabilities on without having flipped it and then we get into ambiguity where you know, know neither the outcome space nor the probabilities and then you get to the far right of the spectrum, which I called ignorance or uh, um, you know, extreme complexity. And the problem, I think, in this whole topic is that we have mostly operated in business schools and teaching and in research on the spectrum of certainty, risk, and maybe uncertainty, not the spectrum where we... So and that's where we can know a lot and do know a lot. And the tools are quantitatively um, solid. If we go to that side of the spectrum where we're dealing with ignorance and ambiguity and uh, epistemic uncertainty that we even don't know what we don't know at a deep level, then I think, th does this fit business schools? Academics are experts. They want to talk about things they know. They don't want to talk a lot about things they don't know. But it is a very, when I was in England, there was a wonderful encyclopedia published called the Encyclopedia of Ignorance. And they asked, Nobel laureate scientist in physics, chemistry, what is it that you don't know in your discipline that you hope at some point you will know? Hmm. That is such a wonderful entree into the subject of uncertainty. That's what we ask companies. Crystal ball question, what would you like to know if you could only ask three questions? And that is such a different starting point for a dialogue 
than talking about all the things we should be doing or what we're good at or the SWOT analysis. That just emphasizes too much the status quo and not the things we really don't know. So I would like to, and Phil and I are working on this, we would like to integrate these two better. And that is that stuff. Shell never really managed to really link these scenarios to the whole budgeting and, and, and CapEx, the capital expenditure process and all of that. They, they didn't want it. So if you have four scenarios, you should really do four plans and ask how much is common and not common between these ones. And then you do your budgets and you have to maybe do four budgets. But if you even get, and that's why I did that experiment on ranges, if you simply use scenario planning to get people to the point where they don't make point estimates anymore of you know revenue or costs or market share or things like that, but they give ranges on it and define them as 90% confidence ranges or 50% confidence ranges, depends on what your setting is, what you would do, or entire probability distributions. You already have made enormous progress in acknowledging uncertainty. So the point is not giving probabilities to scenarios, but uh, ranges of probabilities. And um, well, eventually, am I right? downstream, well, you have to link the scenarios to decisions. So initially, okay. it is what could happen. Then you formulate strategies. These strategies need to take into account competitor analysis and your own competencies. And these strategies lead to plans. These plans lead to budgets. And it is at that level of the plans okay. that you can go back to decision trees and look at option value that is embedded in your, in your strategy. That's but quantitative. Can, no, I understand that that part. That's uh, very intriguing. I mean, but do you give a quantitative value to the scenario as a whole, or no? Uh, uh, the value no, because it is no, because you so, okay. So Cannot, there are four right. scenarios for the future: recession, no recession, and you mm. know, uh, geopolitical conflict with China or war with China. Yes or no? Suppose you do two by two like that. Mm. Uh, this. First of all, you haven't fully specified what the events are, so you couldn't put a probability on that. Right. You could talk in terms of more likely, less likely, but if you if you really give the probabilities to four scenarios, these four scenarios are just four quadrants in a matrix, and there's many other uncertainties. So at best, they accumulate the sum of their probabilities is probably less than one percent. And it should be the point to give probabilities. Has not, right? been, has not been has not been articulated yet. Yes, no, I understand that. That's why I, I ask. So you're giving probabilities to issues that can be um, can be the consequence of scenarios. Am I am I understanding it right? More yes, specific. Correct. Yes. Okay. You we, we're giving probabilities to events that are derived from the scenarios right. that are relevant in a particular project that is being analyzed from a cost benefit viewpoint, such as yeah. the demand the demand being high or low for a product that could be driven. But you have, as you well know, there's a very complex causal chain, influence mm. diagrams that go from the scenario then to what are the relevant. I mean, all projects come down to revenue, cost, competitor behavior, regulatory effects. So you need to translate a scenario back to those parameters which drive the NPV of a project. Mm. That's a well, cascade, right? So in my book, Profit and Certainty, I would lay out that this is a cascade that goes through five levels before you get to that point. Understood. Uh, is this going to be an article or a book you're writing with? Uh, <laughs> I'll take an article. I've, All right. I've just finished two books in the last two years, so that's maybe a little bit much. Taking yeah. a rest. <laughs> well, super looking forward to read that. Is this the first time you write with uh, Philip Tetlock? No, we did uh, three articles. Well, in fact, one is about taboos. How do you develop? Oh, the taboos scenarios? you wrote it with Philip. That's right. That, that's a good. Yeah, that's a good and one. we did an article in the Harvard Business Review on super forecasting. That I think was okay. also uh, a very interesting. And we did one in the uh, in, in actually uh, the Sloan Management Review on creating an intelligent enterprise, sort of with an AI lens. What is what does it take to really foster? intelligence in the forecasting and um, strategic planning sense in an, in an organization. So I've done three, I think, yeah. All right. Well, I really look forward to the next one. And uh, I'll try my best to link all the articles we have mentioned in this chat here uh, in the description box down below for those who are interested. And uh, I particularly recommend uh, Paul's last book, uh, See Sooner, Act Faster, right? That, with George Day. With, with, with George, George Day. Day which, which yes. treats a lot of the stuff we've been talking about, especially in terms of vigilance. So I'm going to post it. I'm, I'm going to paste it uh, just at, uh, at the top of the list. And that Thanks being said, for the plug. <laughs> absolutely. Well, I, 
I thank you uh, immensely, Paul, for the conversation. Yeah, I, I enjoy that a lot. And uh, I especially enjoy the, the, the examples that you bring to the table because oftentimes it is so difficult to understand these issues in an abstract manner, but you have so many examples from practice. So it's just extremely pleasant to, to hear uh, about your conceptualization of this field and to read your book as well. So great talking to you and uh, thanks again for your time. Thank you, Alex or Alessandro, really. I enjoyed it as well. You have very good questions. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye now.